Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am very happy to have my old friend, Mr. Vincent Ward, back on the podcast. Vincent, welcome back on, buddy. Hey, Bart. Glad to be here. Yes. Uh, man, you, you know, I say there's some times where people were really, you know, friends on the podcast and we, you know, talk on the internet, but you and I actually are uh, good friends. And you're one of the people I always enjoy seeing at drum shows. I come in and when I see you, it's just kind of that like, like, I enjoy seeing everyone, but you and I have known each other for years now at this point, and uh, you've been a big help to the podcast. So, uh, Thank you. in general, I appreciate your support over the years with the podcast, too. Yeah, it's nice. I saw you, what, about a week ago, a week and a half ago at the Covington yep. show. That was yep. really fun. The Shields, and, Shields yeah. classic. Yeah, Poe po Shies Rogers thing, which was awesome, which there's an episode coming out soon about that with uh, Anthony. So, um, An yeah, Anthony's man. yeah, Anthony's really great. I, I, I love that show. And it's um, it's a big um, a big draw to go into these shows is being able to see people year after year. And it's really awesome to see what you've built the podcast into because the first episode I did was five and then I did one around 100 maybe. And now you're coming up on 200, right? Yeah, over, you know, over I think I think actually, if I'm not mistaken with my timing, I think you right now on this episode, I think you're episode 200. Yes. So you did it, buddy. You're there because there's been some like I release an old one when I'm catching up after the madness of like the Neil Peart episode and stuff. So how does that count? But your episode 200, I will give you that. Uh, OK, <laughs> that awesome. kind of nice. You milestone. get that title. Congratulations. Yeah. So. Um, all right. But. This this is a lot of info today, and and we'll we'll kind of jump in, and then I have to do a little Patreon thank you. But I want to say, up front, what we're doing and what we're talking about today. This is Vincent's idea. He came to me with this, and I think it's awesome. So we're pretty much going to be talking about the process of buying, playing, and collecting vintage Zildjian symbols, which Zildjian is quite possibly one of the most famous names in the drum industry. Maybe you know Ludwig is up there too, but it's. It's like a household name, or at least people know that, like, you know, they might not be able to pronounce it if they're not a drummer, but um, it, it it's on its 400th year this year. So that's actually pretty, you know, timely that we're doing this. It's something that I know you have a lot of experience with as far as collecting, and so do a lot of people. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different things to cover with it. Yeah, I mean, Zildjian is definitely... At a certain point, they were the only brand for symbols. I mean, there were other brands. We'll talk about those, but you know, 50s, 60s, um, you know, Zildjian was the brand. It was, I don't think they had that motto, the only serious choice at that point, but th that that motto actually made a lot of sense because if you were serious, you didn't play, you know, like Dixie or Crut or, you, you know, you played Zildjian's. And if you didn't have yeah. Zildjian's, you saved and you got Zildjian's. And um, there's a, another episode with Paul Francis that talks more about the history. This is going to be more about my experience with Zildjian, what I've learned, the history is is amazing. You know, having hundreds of years of history, I think maybe um, Zildjian's just an awesome company. I've it was the first symbols that that I had. Um, they've been really really good with advertising, marketing, promoting, um, and they're as far as I know, they're still the biggest. Even with so much more competition, they're still the biggest symbol company. They're they haven't fallen off. You know, they're doing. They have all kinds of modern artists, modern stuff, new models. We're going to be talking primarily from the inception around the early 1900s with K Zildjian's into Avis, uh, Avitas Zildjian's in uh, late 20s, kind of up through the 90s, and then after that, um, that's more of the modern yeah. era. Yeah. Yeah. So it kind of falls in the collecting of like vintage because it really it's weird. But like 90s, I guess, I think 25 years and older in the world of like cars is considered vintage. So I think that applies to this, too. Um, so yeah, for for drums, people usually consider pre 1980 to be vintage. But uh, Zildjian made a lot of cool stuff in the 80s and the, in the 90s, too. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of subtleties to the stuff, the earlier stuff, obviously, that wasn't being as mass produced. There's more variations and things to um things to find there. Um, for, for me, I have a, a strong emphasis on the sound. So you can talk all day about this and that and who played it and what it is and if it's rare or not. But to, to me, the ultimate test of any symbol, but you know, when I'm looking into a Zildjian, I want to hear that symbol. Um, that's what really 
be, because that's a, a very personal experience too. So sure. you could describe a symbol with 15 adjectives and get an idea. You could write the weight of a symbol. This is a 1200 gram, uh, 16 inch symbol, but until you hit that symbol, it's all subjective. So yeah. there's going to be a lot of emphasis in this episode about what was happening at Zildjian during the 20th century. You know, there's still a ton of those symbols. I mean, they made tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of symbols during the 20th century, and a lot of them are still around. So Yeah, just because something's famous and sought after, you may play it and go, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> like, you don't have to yeah. like it, you know, which Absolutely. is a, a watch out. But okay, real quick, uh, huge, I want to give a thank you. Um, so I have a tier on Patreon, $15 a month, where... Um, you sign up and you get a shout out on an episode and you get your name at the end of it uh, on all my videos with a little title card. So before we get into it, Vincent, I want to give a thank you to um, look over here at my notes to Gabriel Martinez, who runs GMD Symbols, uh, which is GM Designs is the company, but GMD dot com. He said, let me read a little blurb, he said it's not your typical company. He says he makes everything that the other symbol makers are not. And that's what he's all about. Um, he says he makes more strange, oddball stuff, stuff that has been um, kind of revised from before and improvised or maybe never been made before. Um, he says he's come out with the first B20 finger symbol, B20 triangle, a multi-bell symbol, and most recently the largest bell ever on a symbol, which is 10 inches. It's a pretty big bell, I tell you what. Uh, and he has the standard symbols uh, he, that he does make are still nothing um, that are being offered by other companies. So the hammering's different, profiles are different, lathing is different. Um, very cool stuff. So you can check him out online at gmdsymbols.com and um, see everything that he's got. I looked at it. It'll take you to his reverb page. And um, it really is pretty cool stuff, like very cool. So be sure to check that out. Uh, and thank you to Gabriel Martinez for signing up. If you guys want to join the Patreon and get a shout out at that upper tier, uh, go to patreon.com slash drum history podcast. And uh, it's really cool because this is a symbol episode and um, it's cool to have him on this as a symbol episode. So um, Vincent, let's jump in here, buddy. And let's start off by talking about uh, maybe before we get into the collecting and the guide, let's hear about your personal history and background with Zildjian symbols and what started this whole thing for you. Okay, so um, I got into vintage drums about 13 years ago, um, and I've always been fascinated by the minutia of, of different things. So I was really fascinated by the variety of Zildjian symbols that I was seeing, old ones, new ones. So the, the journey with, with Zildjian uh, started when I was younger, and then I played some other brands, and when I came back to Zildjian, I was pretty much exclusively looking for the vintage stuff. So I have a, um, a small business that does drum restoration, specifically with pedals, hardware, and parts. Um, but as far as studying Zildjian symbols, trying to learn more about them, that's been uh, something I've been pretty active with for at least the last uh, four years, with really the goal to find specific sounds. So I think all drummers have sounds in their head of how they want their symbols to sound. And during this journey, that sound has, um, I, I found it. It, it, it's, uh, it, took, it took a lot of trying different symbols. And, you know, your ear changes and evolves over time. But um, especially starting during COVID, because everyone was cooped up and bored, I started really shopping heavy for symbols and trying to look for things. I would get things and... Um, I still have most of it. I, a lot of it is wow. in, a lot of it is in storage, but I have a large amount of symbols that I need to decide to let go of. Um, you know, duplicates and things like that, and just basically keep the best ones, the ones that I really want to keep for life, and let go of the rest of them. Um, I love A being symbols. So take you're looking for a twenty inch symbol from the fifties you put two right next to each other and that's the best way that your ear and mind can process which one you actually like better. Just like when you're at an optometrist, you know, really? is this better or is this better? You can, yeah. easy, you can easily tell when you're a being symbols, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, did you, and we'll get into this, but like, I think something that is pretty common is that you, you a B two identical 
quote unquote identical symbols, they don't sound the same, especially if they're vintage and they've, they've aged differently. Do you find that that's pretty common where you may, you may have one that you love and you buy another one on reverb and they don't sound exactly alike? Oh yeah, for sure. And the older you get, the more that is, is the case. Um, just because you have more, um, of an element of, of human manufacturing, things were not mass produced. Um, so, you know, most people like a 20 inch ride. I, I like the bigger symbols. So 24s, 26s and 28s, if you can find them. Um, I don't own a 30. Uh, they're, they're just really hard to buy. Uh, everyone, yeah. everyone, everyone wants them. I know a guy who has two that just sit on his wall. He has them mounted on the wall. Um, most of the 30s are from the 60s and later. To find a pre sixties thirty inch is pretty rare and pretty expensive. So that's that's one that I'm still looking for. I have about ninety percent of what I'm looking for in my drum room. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. And I feel very I feel very fortunate to that uh, to 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 be in that position for sure. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean I uh, we live in different. You're in Maryland now, and I'm in Cincinnati, so we've like never been to each other's houses. But I will say from talking, I mean you've got like multiple camco sets you've got all kind you've got a ton of pedals you have a huge collection so i think people can like understand listening to this that like and, and when we go to drum shows and we've shared booths and things you've like taken me under your wing and like i have very much caught on that you really know your stuff and uh you have you know for a young guy you've you've really been experienced and and known uh, a lot of this stuff so so people can i hope trust what you're saying but well thank you that being said there's a big community about uh, around Zildjian's and vintage symbols in general. Why don't we talk about the people, the predecessors a little bit? Okay, so um, most people are familiar with this, but there's a lot of really good resources online. If you type in uh, Zildjian stamps or Zildjian timeline, most people have the same two questions when they have an old Zildjian. Let's say you find a 20 inch Zildjian at a show, you bring it home. Your first questions you're gonna ask are, how old is it and what is it worth? The second question is much harder to answer than the first. Um, there are really awesome guides. So I'm, I'm gonna mention four people here um, and they're in no specific order, but they kind of are because you, when you're looking into something like this and it's not, it, it's really complicated, you start by building on the knowledge that other people have already, you don't start from scratch. Sure. That would That would be really difficult. So Bill Hartrick was, I believe, there had to have been other people that did this before, but Bill Hartrick's the first person that I know of who is referenced by Steve Black. And Steve Black's resource, you can put a link in the description. That's the one people are familiar, familiar with. There's another resource by Rob Scott. I use both of them and as kind of like to double check each other too. So when you're kind of looking for knowledge that's hard to obtain, it's nice to have multiple sources. So. Steve Black, uh, he's in New Zealand, I think, and Rob Scott, I'm not sure where he's located. They both have, have really awesome online resources that are still up. As far as I know, both of those gentlemen are still alive as well. So they have you could email them if you have questions. And they've yep. just really, you don't have to own, own a symbol to learn about it. So you can document, you could just watch eBay and Reverb and document all these symbols without ever having to, um, own or buy the symbol. And I think that's what a lot of these yep. guys ha have done, or they'll, um, it, it's a community effort. It's not one person is the expert. I'm definitely not that expert. Uh, and I do want to say that before we get into the timeline, that this is information that I've gathered from other sources and I'm not here with any bombshell saying anything really a lot different than what they are. Um, the thing that I've done differently is that I have a bunch of these symbols and I've, I kind of um, am comfortable at this point speculating a little bit more than has been speculated previously, filling in the gaps. There is a fourth person and he's the most important one because I knew him personally and he passed last year. His name is Mike Layton and I'm gonna bring him up um, probably several times because he's the first guy I walked up to at these shows and asked him questions. And you know, when you meet someone who has the same special interest like that and you start talking shop, it is the, the most special magical yeah. thing because they're excited because that someone else cares about what they care about. So um, I'll, I'll mention more about Mike later and um, 
how he in, in influenced my own personal journey. But I think the first thing we should do is go through the timeline by stamp. And we'll do A Zildjian and K Zildjian. And um, this is what other people have extrapolated based on all the information that they've gathered. And um, I have a little bit more in there um, talking basically about the history of Zildjian as these timelines were were taking place. Blue Goose Classic Percussion has provided vintage drum restoration and sales online for over five years. They're pleased to announce that they will be opening Atlanta Drum Shop, a full-service drum destination in Atlanta this summer, 2023. Featuring new and used gear by all your favorite brands, Atlanta Drum Shop will be a true drummer support center and cool hang. And if you love Neil Peart and Rush, come play, not just take pictures, of their Neil Peart R30 commemorative kit, an exact replica of Neil's kit from the R30 tour by DW. And check out their expansive collection of DW Neil Peart replica snare drums and other memorabilia. As huge Rush fans, their goal is to share these drums with the world. Atlanta Drum Shop is opening to the public this summer, 2023. Join their mailing list to get updates at atlantadrumshop.com or find them on social media at Atlanta Drum Shop. And if you love vintage drums, check out bluegoose.com. That's B-L-O-O goose.com. And find them on eBay at Blue Goose Classic Percussion. B-L-O-O Goose Classic Percussion. Thanks to Blue Goose slash Atlanta Drum Shop for sponsoring this episode. We'll start with A Zildjian. And the first A Zildjians that I'm aware of are from 1929. Uh, that's when the company was established. And they had a, a, a good base to build on because K Zildjian already existed. So K Zildjian is existing in Turkey simultaneously to Avidis A Zildjian. And as far as the details of the history and who did what and who was whose brother and who got mad at who, consult the previous Zildjian episode, which is great because boy, is there a lot of that it in this. So yeah. starting in 1929 in, I believe, Norwell, Massachusetts, somewhere in, in New England, Avidis Zildjian start being made. And these first ones that are made from 1929 to 39 are, are referred to as first stamps. If you really want to know when was my Zildjian made, what is the stamp, you can find that information. And sometimes there is some ambiguity. Um, my friend Kelly brought a symbol to the Covington show and he said, it's from the 50s. And I looked at it, I said, no, it's got to be from the 70s. And mm. um, when you looked at the stamp, it was not really clear. Um, so the stamps are a guideline. You also want to look at the evidence in front of you, the actual symbol, how it was made. And um, don't. it's good to not be definitive or arrogant about it. it I, don't, I don't ever say anything definitively because it's just not, that's just not realistic. Um, so at the beginning here, these first stamps, I think it'd be pretty hard to say, oh, they stopped doing first stamps in 37 or 41 or whatever. But um, you can, you know, from previous episodes that we're coming up to a very pivotal time in all United States manufacturing, which is 1942, when you were no longer allowed to use metal. So Zildjian actually weathered that storm really well. And the reason, and one of the things I think that is very unique about Zildjian is still true, true to this day is their their vault. Um, I have I have a piece of, um, of literature that says, that's probably from the 60s, that says basically that once symbols are done being manufactured, they can sit in the vault for up to 15 years. So that creates a huge mm. window. Um, the starting in 1939 estimated to 1942 when they were it's pretty unlikely that they were able to get any bronze b20 bronze is um 80 copper 20 percent tin it's pretty unlikely they were able to get any bronze at all from 1942 to 1946 yeah, so i because I of the war obviously yeah all that all that was needed for the war effort and um it wasn't an optional thing where you couldn't you know no one was allowed to, and, and all the companies had to scramble. The, the history there is, is really fascinating. Tons of episodes are, are going to reference that, and, and this one is too, because second stamps are very, very similar. Your average person, kind of myself included, is not going to be able to look at a first stamp and a second stamp and tell you, oh, that's second, that's a first. 
they're yeah. pretty they're pretty similar vincent can i jump in here and just say that like so when you're saying stamp uh, sometimes i feel like maybe people who are listening to this who maybe don't know like you're not referring to where you look at as uh, a zildjian today and it's like the black logo that's like it's like printed on it it's like the on top these are pressed into the metal that's what we're referring to as a stamp where it's yeah it's you know actually stamped Engra- not engraved, you know the word, I'm pressed it, 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 into the it, it's, symbol. It's pressed in. It's a big, it's a big uh, hydraulic press, probably. And the reason the stamp changes is because you could put a different little thing in there, and that's that's when the stamps change. Is when, but they didn't do it like, all right, it's 1939, time to change to that second stamp. They had, they were just, yeah, producing items. So at some point, yeah. the first stamp, this first stamp wore out, and they brought in the second stamp, and that's how you know, uh, 80 plus years later, we're able to take that information, but everything should be taken with a grain of salt because we know that some symbols sat in the vault for, for 15 years. So 1942, yeah. when uh, the L37 metal rationing came in, they were probably, they probably had a lot of symbols in their vault. And even though they weren't allowed to produce anymore, let's say that they had had a really good end of the 30s and they had thousands of symbols in their vault they wouldn't have been expected to send those off to be melted down for tanks and bullets and things they got they got to sell those so zildjian Zildjian was probably a lot more um situated to to navigate this period because no one knew how long the war was going to last everyone just knew that this was the priority above all manufacturing of non-war effort items yeah so second stamp is 1939 to 1942 we can we can put it go ahead and put a four year gap in there because metal rationing wasn't lifted until the war was over. It was 1946, probably the middle of 1946. Someone can correct me on that and and give me the exact month. But that's when they said, "Here you go. Now you have access to copper and tin." Because they Zildjian is making their own alloy. They're getting shipments of copper, tin. They they're saying there's trace elements of silver in there, but they're getting raw metal and they're melting it down in their little crucibles and they're making their blanks and they're making their symbols. Uh, there's lots of cool videos on how a symbol is made. And um, that at this point, they've been kind of sitting, sitting on their hands for four years. They're really ready to make some symbols. And yeah. that's 1946 to 1953 is what is referred to as the transitional stamp, trans stamp, and we'll see in, in a moment that it's a, a bit of a misnomer because these are not rare symbols. They made tens of thousands. You got to think they're all ready to go. At this point, the war is over and it's time for them. Their vault is probably empty at this point. Let's say yeah. at the beginning of the war, they had thousands of symbols. At the end of the war, they were probably pretty low. Yeah. So what their priority was during this this. Uh, seven-year period was absolutely to make symbols and to make really good symbols too. So trans transitional stamps or trans stamps are the most highly regarded Avidus symbols, and with good reason. They're thin, the profiles are nice. They're um, they just sound amazing. Hand hammering. Mm. They hammered it before they lathe it, and they hammered them a lot of times after they lathe it. You can tell the difference pretty easily when there's post post lathing hammering. Um, it just looks a, a lot different, and you see that a lot on these symbols. Do you think that constant was constituted like I feel like the generation and the time of the player? Then I mean, we're talking 1946 to 53. That's a pretty drum heavy kind of music. I mean, that's Gene Krupa and those guys where they they there's a lot of focus on getting the ideas of you know what's papa joe jones want seems like they're creating some cool stuff just for that reason you know oh oh yeah and there's lots of pictures too of the artists visiting the vault and um even though zildjian had essentially a monopoly on symbol production definitely within the united states at this point they didn't rest on their laurels they were trying to make the best product they possibly could you have to think also this company even though zildjian has a 400 year history the history of the A Zildjian company it starts in 1929, as far as I'm aware. I, I would sure. be I would be pretty surprised if I saw one that was earlier than that because they didn't have a factory. <laughs> so that's good to know. Yeah. So, so um, th- there there is a you know history there, but 
trans stamps what what the key points is there's a lot of them and they sound really good at this point a company that's only been around for uh 25 years or so has a lot to prove um and i think that there was the the type of um objective in the factory was certainly to make the best sounding symbols whoever was doing quality control at this point definitely didn't let a lot of stuff out that wasn't good so even though the consistency wasn't there where you're getting you know in later decades all symbols start to sound alike you know you spit out 10 20 inch symbols they all sound alike during the transitional stamp era that's not true at all i mean you could put 10 up and they all sound different they all might mm. sound good but good is subjective um yeah and yeah. symbols change and they they age too so Transitional stamp is a time period where they're making excellent symbols, they're making a lot of symbols, and they're filling their vault back up. In fact, the stamp changes in 1953 to what is referred to as block stamp. I call it block stamp. Um, I use a little bit of my own uh, nomenclature here because sure. it just makes more sense to me. People call them different things. They're called large stamps, hollow blocks. Very easy to tell with this stamp um, if you know what you're looking for. And they probably just switched to this stamp because the other, because the trans stamp ran out. Um, it, it ran out of juice. It, it was just, it had probably been pressed, you know, thousands and thousands of times. And there's a bit of a flaw that makes it very easy to identify trans stamps in that the pressure is higher on the edges. So the Z and the O and Co is much more indented. Um, sure. That makes it very easy to. Uh, identify trans stamps and that's why you can google that term now zildjian trans stamp is going to give you a result of a lot of these symbols because there are a lot of them and they're super easy to identify um yeah now yeah. is that really the main reason like you've said a few times now the reason they change these stamps is not because of like it's the end of a generation we're moving on to the next generation it's like the the, the stamp the press wears out we need a new one Let's design a new one. Okay, maybe we add the dots back to USA or something like that. Yeah, just like just like badges, they would have used that as an opportunity to improve. Um, so the one that was going to follow the trans stamp, the well, one thing, the press is never going to wear out. The same press pressed every, the same press probably presses the stamps all the way up until they start doing it with lasers. Yeah, because that machine sure. does not wear out. But the the actual die that you put in there that it, that is stamping the the metal stamp in, in there definitely changes and um i hope that with this episode that other people step forward and say well i actually know a lot more about this and you could do another episode just on the stamps because we have more considerations to talk about the stamps are yeah. the, the stamps are a guideline so within the trans stamps you have type one type two and type three and boy do you have to be pretty deep in the rabbit hole to be able to tell the difference i i still consult the guide e even owning you know a lot of these symbols and even I can't tell the difference on site between a trans stamp type one, two and three. I know some people can, but it's actually not super important, especially if you're if you're emphasizing the sound. So um, for whatever reason, the block stamps only lasted about two years, 53 to 55. Um, I would guess this information was largely gathered by talking to people who are original owners. So if someone says, hey, here's my Ludwig kit that I bought with all new Zildjians in 1954, and it's got all block stamps, that's a pretty good piece of information. And then the guy comes forward and says, hey, well, mine's from 1956, and now it doesn't have the block stamp. Um, again, that's imperfect science because sometimes the symbols are sitting for 15 years, but some yeah. of them are also getting made and probably sent right out too, depending on supply and demand. You know? Sure. No, that makes sense. And, and again... I'll just jump in with things so people kind of know if they're watching or not watching and just listening. The block really refers to like, like it is like as if you're doing like, I don't want to say bubble letters, but it's like, it's as if there's, there's space in, but like Z-I-L-D-J-I-A-N has space in between the lines of each letter. Hopefully that explains it. That's what yeah. it is. That's what you're looking for. Yeah. I would be interested to know why they discontinued the use of this because based on the trans stamp, we, we know that a stamp can last, you know, eight to 10 years, but for some yeah, reason, this, this one this one only lasted a little longer. And who, who knows, that information is lost to history. If somebody comes forward and they know that, I would be so thrilled to, to, to learn more ab ab about these 
specific transitions, but block yeah. stamps are also great, but they're different. The bells are higher profile, the hammering is different. So during this whole process, everything is changing a lot with the manufacturing. Block stamps, uh, I bet, because I'm so obsessed with the sounds, I bet you could put a 22 block and a 22 trans next to each other and I would be able to easily tell the difference. That's yeah. something changed in the manufacturing around the mid 50s. And um, you gotta think at this point, the the wounds of, of the war are starting to heal. They are able to get back in their groove and really start manufacturing cymbals. Um, drum drum set um, playing is, is growing and at, in in 56 you start seeing some what I call large stamps or large stamp type one this is going to get a little confusing I don't want to get terribly hung up on it but um, this is the first time they used a large stamp this stamp is much bigger than other stamps um, hollow block is also or block stamp is also a quite large stamp compared to other ones but so large stamp just existed for a couple of years. This might have been like a backup die that they had where um, maybe somebody dropped the block stamp and it fell under a table <laughs> and they said, okay, bust out the backup stamp. <laughs> and now we're getting large stamps in the, in, from, in, in the late 50s and, um, you know, like 56, 57. But at some point they get their new stamp in and this is the small stamp. And this one existed all throughout the late 50s so 57 to 60 uh there's two different types and they're easy to tell the difference because one is it could have even been a setting or a way that you stamped the symbols because this was somebody's job was stamping mm. this the symbols and they probably just sat there and stamp symbols all day but um yeah. when you look at the at the the stamp guide you could usually tell pretty pretty easily um the yeah, well, it between, looks like between the a and b and it looks like just so people know this, the large stamp, they have, there's a, you know, tape measure, or a ruler next to it. it. looks like that was about two inches top to bottom. And then the small stamp seems to be like less than an inch. It, it depends on how, on how you're measuring it because there's such good resources online. I yeah. don't in my head does not exist the ability to know all those different things. I find it really interesting, but I can identify them enough so that when I'm walking around a show, I pick it up. Oh, this is a small stamp. I'm not thinking, oh, you don't it's have a your ruler. Yeah, b b because when you're shopping for symbols in person, it's really easy. You just hold the symbol up and you go, you do that one hit and then you do the, the edge, maybe you hit the bell, but your ears are what's being trained, not your mind. And, and it's, yeah, it's the, sure. ty the type, type of thing where it's like the less you think about it, the better result you're probably gonna get because it's not about Oh, trans stamps are amazing, but block stamps, they're not as good. And small stamps, they're not good at all. It's really not yeah. like that. It's totally subjective. And different people were making these symbols. It wasn't Joe, you know, Joe Zildjian sitting there making every symbol. There were guys who were great at making symbols and guys who probably were not that good. People who were learning and people who got better. Um, Zildjian always had great quality control. So they're never going to send out, it was would have been pretty rare, especially around this time period, for them to be sending out anything that wasn't good. But at this point, as the company is evolving and growing, they're, they're getting better, just like any other company. Their, their, their goal is to maximize profit, but it's also to make a good product. Symbols break. If you make a symbol that doesn't break as often, that people are happy with, then once you send that symbol out to the distributors, it's not like a, a, a nightmare that's gonna come back to haunt you where it's like, well, hey, I got the symbol, but it's got a manufacturing defect. Zildjian always had amazing quality control, and yeah. I would think that they probably still do. So now we're into 1960, and there's another change. So the 60 stamp looks very similar. The way to tell is it has three dots. The small stamp doesn't have three dots in, in that little, in the Arabic script. The 60s one does. So most people mm -hmm. on a basic level, when they pick up a symbol, they can think it either has the dots or it doesn't. And there's, there's some ambiguity to that. But generally speaking, if you pick up a symbol, it's got a small looking stamp and it's got the three dots in it, you probably have a 60s symbol. The lathing gets a little wider. Um, maybe they're using a different tool, maybe they're using a different technique, but they're definitely trying to make a more consistent symbol at this point. They don't want all of their symbols to sound different, even though that's really cool. Now they're, during, now they're in a period where they want that consistency because if you're out on tour, and you break your 20 inch symbol and you love that 20 inch symbol and you're heartbroken and you go to the store and you hit another one, it sounds 
pretty close, that's kind of what um, what they're looking for as a company is that type of consistency where people can really rely on Zildjian's and know, yeah. hey, I'm getting something that is a quality product that is going to last and the consistency is there. It's what I expect to hear when I hit a symbol. Yeah. Um, so I have the 60s stamp error going from 60 to 68. I can personally tell from looking at them that they were doing a lot of experimenting during this time period. I've seen 60 symbols that are made just like 50 symbols. Um, I'm not exactly sure when they stamped the symbols. I would think as soon as they passed quality control, they stamped them because um, we'll get into this a little bit more uh, later, but they have Zildjian seconds that were never stamped. So if your symbol is made, you've hammered it, you've lathed it, it's finished and it doesn't sound good, they're not gonna stamp it. But they're interesting. But they're also yeah. not going to melt it down. Those symbols became what are known as Zildjian seconds. They either sold them to Manny's in New York, and Manny stamped them with Manny stamp, and almost always they're it's cosmetic. So it's not like oh, it sounds really bad. It's a cosmetic default that says ah, you know, this is a fine sounding symbol, but it's not worthy of the Zildjian stamp. So yeah. it's possible, I guess, that they didn't stamp them until much later. That they went into the vault and they did sit there. And then later they stamp them. Um, that's kind of hard to determine, but I can tell from looking yeah. at a '60s symbol if it was made kind of in the early, middle, or late '60s. That's interesting. I, I mean, that's uh, I never would have thought. I, I thought it would have been a production line of like boom, boom, lathing, you know, hammering, late, whatever it is, rolling, hammering, lathing, uh, whatever you do in those steps. I'm clearly showing that I don't know the full process of how they're made, but then stamping and then you're done and then you go from the vault to selling but i guess it makes sense where if the stamp is on it it's been through quality control then you can put it out because yeah i guess then it would go to the second line like you said manny's or zilco or whatever it, it is and then uh that's i've never thought of that that's very interesting yeah i i think quality control has always been a big part of zildjian uh uh, I'm not going to remember this guy's name. His first name is Leon. I can't remember his last name, but this is the guy who was doing quality control in the 80s and the 90s. And he, boy, did he get good at his job because his job was taking a rack of 20s and just hitting them. Ah, oh, sounds great. You know, hit another one. Hmm. Sounds great. Hit another one. Ah, uh, well, this doesn't sound quite right. Put this over into a different pile. And um, everyone knows that when the Beatles were on Sullivan, that uh, everything changed. So now yeah. all of now everyone wants symbols. Well, what does Ringo play? Ringo plays Zildjian. Well, I want Zildjian's. So now all of their hard work and brainstorming and and effort to make their production as good as possible, they were again, and you, you'll see a pattern. Zildjian's a very smart company. The people who are running it and making decisions all the way down to the people who are operating the machines it's it's a extremely efficient process. I, I I don't know of this is you know my opinion, but I don't know of any symbol any Zildjian symbols where you're going to pick them up and say, oh, that's horrible. You know, the, the, no. it, it just didn't happen. I think you're getting more and more modern. The '60s are still you know not as modern as 2023, where people i've heard people say with drum sets nowadays you're not going to get a bad one like it might be different but you're not getting one where it's falling apart similar to like cars you're going to get a pretty good car no matter what you buy but back in those days i guess it was getting to more of the consistent uh repeatable patterns and processes where you're still going to get pretty good stuff but yeah i don't think you're going to pick one up and just go ugh terrible and i but i do remember with hearing uh, and everyone has heard this at some point in their, you know, drum history knowledge of uh, when the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan, it was, you know, 90,000 orders were placed for Zildjian symbols or something like that. So a lot of pressure to keep up with it, but you don't want quality to fall because then you're in trouble. Well, also, when you look at these Zildjian videos, how a symbol is made and they've been making uh, I have a VHS. I don't I have no way to play it, but I would love to yeah. get a VHS player one day and play this because it's from the 90s and it's the same thing the zildjian secret how zildjians are made and it didn't change much it's, it, it, they're not sitting there okay how can we make a symbol totally different they're 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 wanting to make them consistent and these machines are not something that you want to be messing around with i mean these are dangerous machines you do not want to you know step up and lay the symbol if you don't know what you're doing because it's going to 
it's a rotary tool and it's going to pull the thing out of your hand and you're going to get hurt or you're going to hurt somebody else. So uh, again, you know, you've got this concept of the vault, which still exists. You know, you see these cool videos with all these stacks and stacks of symbols, all these different designations. Back then there was a lot less designations, but um, their vault ebbed and flowed maybe in, in, in the early 60s. And in 1963, you know, by the middle of that year, I bet their vault was pretty empty because oh, when, you yeah. have, when you have 90,000 orders, you fill all your orders and then you say, okay, well, let's produce some more. At this point, there's no way that symbols are sitting in the vault for 15 years aging. I mean, that just sounds yep. totally not correct. I mean, when they, were done, when they were done, they passed the quality control, they went into their crates, they went to the dealers and the dealers were anxiously waiting their arrival because you have these kids. I, I love the episode where Rob Cook talks about when he was waiting for his you know, for one of his orders to come and he called the shop like every day and he went there like every day. Hey, is my order ready yet? Hey, is my order ready yet? You know, when that Zildjian crate, when that shipment showed up, you were making a lot of people really happy and everybody was making money. Um, So the 60s were a really awesome era. These symbols sound different. They just sound different than the ones made in the 50s. After 63, they don't have the virtue of sitting there. Oh, this one's okay, but it's not great. Let me go back. Let me send it back to hammering. That didn't happen. You don't see post lading hammering on 60 symbols. It was either it either passed or it failed. And if it failed, it was a manis and it got a, and it got sent off. They would not stamp them. So you see Zildjian's all the time with no stamp. You look and look. You can look for three days and think, oh, maybe it's really faint or maybe whatever. Wow, that's You'll amazing. never find a stamp, but you can tell it's a Zildjian. It was a pass fail type of situation here in quality control because they had, if it really was 90,000 orders sitting there in, in the books, you know, they had a lot of pressure to fill these orders. I just got asked then with the ones that aren't labeled where they were Manny's and it doesn't, let's say it doesn't have a stamp on it at all. How would you know that it would be Zildjian? Would it just be your keen eye of, of looking at so many symbols and being able to tell the alloy and all that stuff? Yeah. You look at the lathing, you look at the hammering, you look at the profile and uh, also just the color of the symbol. So a B8 symbol is a different color than a B20 symbol. Um, I mean, you have to guess a little bit, but you can be pretty sure because of how consistent 60s symbols look. Um, that's a concept. The idea of seconds and many symbols, uh, those don't exist really before the 60s because okay. the, the everything's changed in the factory at that point. It, everything's different. And I'm speculating kind of a lot on this, but I've also spent a long time thinking about it and I'm just using my own um, logical extrapolation skills to know what was occurring in the world at these at, at these points. You know, everything yeah. everything did change once Ringo was on Ed Sullivan. Everything changed for popular music. You know, and yep. um, so the, the six throughout the sixties, you know, they're making these symbols and they get very consistent and very good. And then in the late sixties, I think their sixty stamp probably ran out again, or somebody kicked it under a table, or because. <laughs> They bring back the large stamp. Remember the large stamp from 56 and mm-hmm. 57? Their yep. backup stamp. And again, I'm speculating here. <laughs> yeah. You see that for a little while in the late 60s. And when you see the large stamp, everyone's like, oh, they're 50s, they're 60s. I think they're both because I, you can tell from the stamp's just the first piece of information. After that, you're looking at um, the qualities of, of the symbol. So if you see a symbol that looks, everything looks like it's from the 50s and has a large stamp, it probably is from the 50s. If you see one that looks more like a 60s, it's probably from the 60s. You, you, you're never, it's, not, it's, not imper, it's not perfect information, you are guessing. But those, yeah, yeah. those large stamp type twos from the late 60s, they sound great because at some point they, they finished that last 90,000th order and they were like, we are caught up, let's start filling the vault up again. <laughs> yeah. And those symbols sound great. To me, they sound better than 60 stamps, but that's my personal opinion. Um, so Zildjian survived all that period. They survived the war. They survived the 50s where they're where they're learning kind of how to make really great symbols. They survived the 60s where they're 90,000 orders backlogged. And now they're into the 70s and you get a brand new stamp, the 70s stamp. It's pretty easy to tell. It's got, it's everything, the lines are thinner. It does not have the three dots. So if you look at a symbol and the salt the stamp looks smallish, but it doesn't have the three dots, it's probably either 50s small stamp or 70s thin stamp, whatever you want to call it. The 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 exact words are not important. And all of this, all of the wording has kind of already been set in stone by these guys who did all the research 20 plus years ago. And you're referring just so people know you're referring to not the dots that are in the USA and the made in USA at the bottom, but you're referring to no having no three dots up in the Ottoman engraving up top, which says 
company Avidus Zildjian in their different Ottoman uh, Turkish language, as I'm seeing here on black.net.nz. So the, yeah. that's that's also what's cool about this Zildjian journey is there is so much information. There's no way one person could could really know all of it. That's why it's awesome to have these reference materials. And um, yeah, so y- yeah, w- w- we went through the period where there's a lot changing. Now we're in the 70s. So from 70 to 77, you've got your 70s stamp. Now there was ink stamps on these symbols. There's ink stamps going all the way back to first stamps. You know, at some point they had little ink stamps and, and um, you know, ink, ink blotters that they would put the stamps on, but a lot of them didn't get that. Um, you know, if you if you the way symbols were ordered at the time, if you if you wanted an extra thin, sixteen inch symbol, that would have been something that was maybe they didn't have so many of, and when they were done, they would have stamped it just to say, "Hey, look, we made this symbol, and it's an extra thin." Um, so that mostly it's the weight designation. You also see ones that say like um, other things on them. You know, they had a little set of ink stamps at Zildjian during this whole period that we've been describing, but. Um, in the 70s, especially in the late 70s, uh, so like ones that are in the mid 70s, that's when you start seeing that really iconic block lettering that says medium ride, earth ride, you know, something changed in, during that time period where they said, okay, now the models that we offer are going to be different and they're going to be designated. So when you go to the store and you're shopping and you see three 20 inch Zildjian say, okay, here's a medium, there's another medium, oh, this one's a rock ride and it's heavier, it's pingier. Well, I like that rock one. Now that becomes part of part of the the, the process is is putting yeah. these these symbol designations. That ha- that Smart. starts taking that starts taking place more so in the mid seventies, I would guess. By seventy eight, that's when you get the first Zildjian ink stamp, and they call it hollow ink because it's not filled in. So it's the Zildjian with a thin outline. Those are great symbols. I mean, they're really wonderful symbols that exists from seventy eight to eighty two. In 82, at some point, the Zildjian becomes solid and pretty much all of these symbols, I would think, it was part of their process to designate that this is a medium ride, this is a medium thin, medium thin crash, medium crash. And these changed throughout that t- time period. There's a lot of good literature. There's stuff on Drum Archive. Um, but during during this period, um, you start to see the ink designations from 82 to 92 the process is pretty is pretty streamlined. Well, I mean, I would say at 82 to 92, if I'm not mistaken, 81, Bob Zildjian leaves. 83, he's allowed to take on the American market or something like that in, in that range is when Sabian comes into the into the world. So they got, that's like, you know, lighting a fire a little bit there. There's some, not that Meinl wasn't competition, not that Peisty wasn't competition with all of their you know, kind of things. But now this is, you know, Sabians in Canada, but it's a lot closer to home. And I mean, literally it's the family. <laughs> so things, yeah. there's, there's a different dynamic going on. So seeing how they interacted and, and thinking about the reasons why these changes might've been made is really interesting. Um, but yeah, they have more competition now. Peisty comes in strong in the seventies and a lot of people like that sound. It was just so different. And, um, you know, Zildjian, it, Zildjian was always a company that was that was going to continue trying to improve and make better products. But, you know, lighting the fire is, is a good analogy because they did lose some serious market share. If in the 60s they had whatever, 90 plus percent of the market share, now it's lower. Maybe they're at 75 or 80 percent of market share. And there's somebody, there's the people that are in there hammering and lathing and making the symbols and the people who are deciding what's a rock ride and what's a medium ride and then there's the people who the suits the guys who are sitting behind the desks and thinking okay we're getting killed by peisty how can we compete with them and um all that's happening simultaneously and um in the early 90s so there's symbols that were made in the 90s that don't have a serial number on them just from probably 92 to 94 um this is by this point a customs exist uh z's exist there's different designations if you look at your stamp and underneath there's no serial number, then it was made before 1994. The last era of stamp is 94 through present, and that's those were all done by lasers. So they look different because they start using a laser to, to do the. So if you have a serial number, you can easily date your symbol. You can look at your, the first, there's two letters 
And based on what those two letters are, you can say this was a symbol that was manufactured in 97 hmm. or 2002. Wow. And that's a really cool system. It would have been awesome if they did that right at the beginning, <laughs> uh, which never, yeah. would have, never would have happened. But during the yeah. 90, 90s and onward, it's there's no more amb- ambiguity. I have a symbol. This is and there's guides for this. 90 Zildjian's are just super cool. I mean, seeing A customs, yeah. how they're developed, seeing Z, which turned into Z custom. Um, For sure. You've got EFX symbols, EFX piggyback. They're doing different things. They're having, they're still getting artist, um, artist input to, to, to make these decisions. But yeah. that's, that's the run of, that's the run of stamps for A Zildjian. So that took a lot longer than I expected with the A Zildjian stamps because we were talking so much about the factory and the things that were going on um, during the time no, but period. It's a- it's interesting, and I'm I am looking at your outline here, though, and and to to, well, we let's I guess yeah, there's A and there's or I'm sorry, there's K as well. So that seems like a little bit less information. Oh no no no, it's much much more, <laughs> and and it, and, and it, it is so. Um, I, I'm going to speed run through the K stamps because I know a guy who can do a K stamp episode, and he knows a hundred times more than me, and he actually owns all the symbols. So I okay. only I only own a handful of old Ks. They're expensive. I miss the boat. You know, I do have some old Ks. I love them, but um, that's a totally different uh, different sure. episode. I'm going to speed run real quick through the K Zildjian stamps. So K Zildjian starts before A Zildjian. So you have symbols being made in 1907 through 1929. They say Constantinople, and that's you know literally the name of the country changed. Um, so if it says Constantinople. You know that it's during this time period, and the subsets in for these K stamps are, uh, I I don't know them. I mean, they're, they're, there's guys who could say, this is a old stamp type two C. And that means something. The stamp changed a lot. And, and in Turkey, the stamps were not being done with a hydraulic press. They were definitely somebody holding a stamp and somebody else hitting a hammer onto it. So, sure. so there's a lot more um, variation between them. And people, most people, think that old Ks are the best symbols ever made. And I wouldn't disagree. I mean, there's a lot of variation. They don't all sound good. Uh, a lot of them are cracked, but generally speaking, if you put your stick on an old K, you're going to hear something pretty magical with the old stamps. It's even, even more so. So 29 to 59, that's a 30 year period. Those are all old stamps. And that's why there's so many designations. Um, these same guys have also tried to figure out the K, the K line, the, the, the K stamps. Um, but in 59, and, and remember, these companies are operating independently. There's no um, collusion between A Zildjian and K Zildjian at this point. They are competitors, um, even though they're both using using the name. So um, in 59, they changed to intermediate stamps. Um, kind of. So if you look back to Zildjian, you know, during this time, Zildjian's in the small stamp era. They're about to hit the 60s, and they're you know they're ready to they're ready to rock. K Zildjian was probably following a very similar timeline. So um, 59 to um, 66 is is in, intermediate stamp. And in 67 to 77, which is when the K's, uh, Turkish K Zildjian factory uh, folded, that last decade are new stamps. And those sound a lot different. An old stamp and a new stamp are clearly different by, by sound, by visual. Yeah. Um, old stamps are more made by hand. They were, they were, um, you know, using a sledgehammer to put to press the bells in shape. Totally different process, Turkish made versus American made. Totally different things. But that's the speed run. If you want to know more about K Zildjian's, I'm going to recommend a, a guy who who can talk more about that more intelligently and definitively. And yeah. um, but just to know that those companies are operating simultaneously, but following the same same trends. You know, K Zildjian got an influx of orders in the '60s too. You know. Yeah. Sure. And I mean, just to give my like, you know, outside, I mean, I'm a drummer who loves Zildjian, but my outsider perspective, if you have a K, they they do not like the early ones, they do not look similar stamp wise at all. It's very clearly, I mean, like it, like it says Istanbul or Constantinople, they're very different stamps, which if you have such a special and nice symbol, you probably kind of know what you're looking for a little bit more just because you have such a special symbol. But look at these guides that are in the description. But they are not, it's not something where you'll you'll look at it and go, you know, oh, I'm not sure which one it is. It's pretty clear that these are hammered with, you know, a little like, you know, stamp in their hand. It's it's obvious that these are a different kind of stamp. 
Yeah, t- a totally different thing. And I, I know people who love K's and A's. I know people who just love K's, just love A's. Um, so the the next thing that I want to talk about is is buying considerations. So we've just went through the history of this, and we were pretty pretty thorough with it. I, I tried not to have any overlap of knowledge that's either super commonly known or is in the guides or has been covered in other episodes. But um, so that's my timeline of, of, of A Zildjian and, and briefly of K Zildjian. But the, the part that I think is really interesting is the buying consideration. So now you know all this and you're interested and you want to play old Zildjians. So what do you consider when you're, when you're buying, when you're out here shopping for these symbols? So, um, I, I have these things in, in order of importance. So the number one is always sound. So you're buying symbols online, you expect to hear a sound file. Uh, if you're buying a symbol without a sound file, you either really know what you're doing or you've just made a horrible mistake because it, it's such a subjective thing and symbols don't all survive either. So if you've ever heard a symbol that just sounds totally dead and dry, that's because it was probably in a fire. Um, you, you, you see them all the time. It's just, it's, it's almost like surreal to hit it and just doesn't even sound like a symbol. There's just nothing left there. Something about the, the heat uh, or, or be, being in a fire, um, you know, so it might look like the greatest symbol ever and you hit it and you're just super disappointed. Yeah, um, something's wrong. Yeah. So I actually, a couple of years ago, maybe maybe like a year ago, I just stopped shopping for symbols online. I I, I had gotten a lot of the stuff that I, that I wanted and I really got fed up with buying symbols online. And the main reason is that you can't possibly know how they're going to sound. Even hearing a sound file, it's in someone else's room. It might be processed. You have no idea. So personally, where I'm at in my own symbol journey, and because there's not a ton of stuff left that I'm looking for, I just buy symbols in person. I'll go to a drum shop and hit a symbol, and I'll, I'll you know, be able to have a lot better information there and be much more likely to... Um, be happy with my purchase, or I'll go to a drum show. Even if there's a hundred other people hitting cymbals, I've trained my ear to the point that I can hold up a cymbal on the one finger and hit it, you know, hit it with a stick and know pretty much in one hit, whether or not it's a cymbal that, that appeals to, to, to my ear. So Hmm. yeah, that's not the kind of thing that's easy to, to teach or explain. You have to just hit a lot of cymbals and you have to, you have to be committed to, to the quest of of finding the symbols because it's not like you're buying a 20 inch a custom ride where you can literally hit 10 of them and they all sound great maybe they're slightly different weights the second consideration is gram weight people usually give the weights in grams and that can start to really mean something so i know because i've shopped for 24s for so long that a 24 inch symbol that weighs 3000 grams is going to sound pretty good and one that weighs 4000 grams i'm not interested in it whatsoever um, anything less than 3000. Now we're in an interesting territory because that's really light. And, um, that might be, uh, where, where you could make a pretty speculative decision. If someone said, I've got a 24 inch symbol and it's, and it's 2,700 grams. Well, that's a really light symbol. And for, like for a 22, something that's the same weight range would be like anything that's around 2000 grams or slightly less that's the kind of thing you can only really start to start to incorporate into your into your buying when you've just heard a lot of symbols. But you can yeah. absolutely you can absolutely shop online. You know, definitely listen to sound files. But um, sure, that's a good way to look at it. Use the sound files to gain your knowledge and education, and then try if you can to go into a store or drum shop, knowing what you've learned through the sound files. Makes sense. Sh- sure, and and. Um, I have the third consideration here as condition. So really look for cracks. And that's why in a sense, and really listen for cracks too. If you're buying a symbol and you're in a, in a loud drum room, absolutely hit it and hold it right up to your ear and see if you hear a rattle. Because if a symbol was cracked, that's really bad. I mean, the, the, no, the, yeah. it's, you can repair cracks and there's lots of cracked symbols that sound great. But once a symbol is cracked, it's, it, it's a different type of, type of thing. Um, it's, it's just, uh, I mean, A, it kills the value, and B, it's only going to continue cracking. So yeah. you really have to factor that in. Um, 
And uh, I have as the fourth consideration source. Is the source trusted or are they untrusted? So a drum shop that's been around for 20 years, or even a lot of these younger guys who have their own drum shops that are specifically vintage focused, a lot of them have a really good reputation. So if they sell you something and there was no damage disclosed and you get it and it's damaged, they're going to take care of you. Some of them. Some of them are going to are going to say, you know, well, you're SOL because you bought the symbol and it sold as is. And, yeah. you know, I didn't see the crack. You didn't see the crack. You've yeah. already the transaction's over and you're going to have a really hard time getting your money back. But that's like yeah. a that's like the type of thing that's only going to happen once. If 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 that's happened to you, you're probably never going to buy from that source again. So you either trust your source or you don't. And if you're buying from Joe Schmo on Facebook and they're saying, hey, I got a 22 inch Zildjian, you know, it's 1700 grams. It's an old K, old stamp type 2B or whatever. Well, do we trust this person or do we not trust it? We can trust the drum shops because their reputation is on the line and they wouldn't exist if they kept screwing people over. But can we trust this random person on Facebook? Maybe, maybe not. So yeah. consider consider the source of your of your symbols. It takes the reason that, that drum shops are going to charge you a little more for your symbols is because they're doing the due diligence for you. You know, take your, your fingernail like this and run it all the way along the edge of a symbol. And, and how many times does it catch on something? Are they cracks? Are they are they uh, flea bites? Are they are they big dings where a piece of the symbol is missing? All those affect the value of the symbol, but also so we're all the way down to number five before I'm even considering the price. That's a mm, really big really, consider. Yeah. That's a really big consideration. So once you've you've factored in all of those other considerations, now what is the price? So uh, it's a twenty inch trans stamp, and they want seven hundred and fifty dollars for it. Well, that's a lot of money. Um, the condition better be pretty much perfect. You know, the, you go backwards. Well, does it sound really good? Is the weight really light? Is it from a trusted source and it's in perfect condition? Well, now maybe $750 is actually a great deal for this symbol. Um, I've seen 20 inch symbols that are like 1200 to 1300 grams. I mean, they shouldn't even exist. It's almost like it was a contest at the factory to see who could lay the most off. Yeah. but. They exist and Jeez. yeah, cool. As the years go on, less of them exist because they break. You know, a thin symbol is going to break. So, um, thinking about the price versus the other considerations, that's where you get your value consideration. Well, what kind of value am I getting here? If you have a twenty inch trans stamp and the guy wants fifty bucks, go ahead and pull fifty bucks out and buy. You know, check to make sure it's not cracked and go ahead and pay your fifty bucks because it doesn't matter if it's the worst dog ever. You got such a good deal. Yeah, that someone wants it. Exactly. And I have had deals like that too, where, you know, you hit a 22 inch trans stamp and, and the, you ask the person how much and they say a hundred or 200 bucks and you don't have to think about it anymore because so all, all these, all these factors weigh into your, your decision. Um, this is kind of going back to the source, but um, you know, you thought about the condition, the weight, how it sounds, the value um, you thought about the source. Is this a symbol you're going to be able to return? So if you buy something from someone in a parking lot and you don't even know their name, you know, you're just meeting up with them off Facebook and then you go back and they've deleted their Facebook. Well, that's going to be a no returns situation. Yeah. <laughs> it's your, it's, it's, yeah. it, it's your symbol now. But if you bought from yeah. a reputable shop and you don't like it, well, maybe they'll give you your money back or give you a store credit and then you can continue shopping for symbols. Sure. Um, and that there may be a little bit of like you buy a symbol on Facebook and you just don't like it after a week and you want to return it. That's that's nothing wrong with the symbol. That's yeah. There's that's not how the world works. Where you know, again, it, you didn't do anything wrong. You can also not do returns, and it's not a bad thing. It's just that you didn't check yeah, it out or something. A lot of these shops that deal primarily in vintage, they just have an as-is policy. You can't return yeah. it because it's a slippery slope where you say, oh well, if you just didn't like it, you mean gets it's same with drums. You get it, and it's a little less green than I thought it was going to be. Well, I'm really sorry, but as the buyer, th there's a there's a phrase called caveat emptor and it means buyer beware or basically means do your own due diligence that is uh pretty um important with symbols yeah. if you buy a symbol and it doesn't say anything about the condition that's a red flag because very few symbols especially as they get older are in perfect condition it's kind of up to you to ask the, the right questions and that's why again a, a reputable drum shop is going to tell you hey this doesn't have any cracks any keyholes any flea bites or edge damage no warping 
that's great. If they say all those things, then you're covered. Because if you get it and it's warped and cracked, well, now it's item not as described and you can easily get your money back from however you paid. Two more just quick considerations that are lower in the list is, is rarity. So I said I'm looking for a 30 inch pre 60s Zildjian symbol. I've only ever seen two. So when one comes up, I better factor in that rarity because regardless of what the price is, regardless of what the condition is, and almost regardless of how it sounds, I might never see one again. If there's only two and the people who have them aren't, aren't going to come up off them, then, you know, that's a pretty strong factor. And that's why I put the last one as, as FOMO, which means fear of missing out. If you've been looking for a 30 inch symbol or a 28 inch symbol for uh, five years and one finally comes up, you better have that money ready and you better yeah. be ready yeah. to, to compete with a lot of other people who are also maybe looking for the exact same thing. Sure. It's like the, it's worth what someone will pay for it. Kind of old saying where, uh, if you really want it, then you can pay a little more for it. And just all of this before we move on to the next section, just makes me think that like learning these things, having this knowledge makes going to drum shops and drum shows even more fun because you can look at this Someone might look at a rack of old symbols and say, "Ah, eh, I don't, okay, whatever. I'm not looking for a symbol. But if you know what you're looking for, you can do the hunt and like flip it over and look at the stamp and look for the three dots and look for, is it a K? Is it this? And then you get another level of like, of fun, of enjoyment from your search, which is just a super cool thing to have the ability to do. It's, it's a cool level of immersion too, because the ability to get a good deal lessens as, so if you were going in, to my buddy Joe's shop, Wooden Weather, you're not gonna go in there and find something where you know more about it than he does because he just knows so much about it. So he, he's yep. he's coming in and you say, hey Joe, what is this? He's not gonna be like, oh, I don't know, it's an old symbol, give me a hundred bucks. He's gonna be like, well, <laughs> yeah. it's an 18 inch old K and it's light and it sounds great. The price, yep. is, the price is $1,300. And you yeah. know, a, a, as, a, as a dealer and, and someone who really has their finger on the pulse for that stuff and, and goes through hundreds of symbols per year, it helps you shop a little bit, but it's different than going into uh, like an antique mall and finding that same 18 inch old K and the price is maybe 200 bucks, but that's still an amazing deal. Um, sure. The shopping part of it is definitely very fun. The more educated you are, the more likely you are to be able to find what you're looking for. Because some of it is, you know, we went through nine different factors to consider when you're looking for, for a symbol. You don't have to factor in all nine of those. You could just say, you could just do that first one. Hey, I hit this symbol and I like it. There's some people in this world who are independently wealthy where the price is no object to them. They hit a symbol and they like it. Hey, how much does it cost? Oh, well, it's $700. You know, here you go, $700. Yeah. <laughs> the, the prices, I, I, I know plenty of people like that where the, the price is not an object. The sound is, they just factor in that first one. And, um, Maybe the condition, maybe the condition, the source. Maybe they're not worried about returning it because they just hit it and they know that they love it. It's exactly what they've been looking for for yeah. years. Yeah, you not know? buying to sell. They just want to play it, and that's what they like. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, life is short, so you know when I when I die and they figure out what to do with my piles of symbols, somebody's gonna have a really <laughs> fun time looking at what yeah. I collected, what I kept, and why, and then figuring out what it's worth and how to sell it. I mean, good luck to them because the majority of the stuff I have, I'm not ever selling it. I mean, the because I went through this journey, it took me years and years and years. I invested so much time, energy, and money into it that the thought of selling it never enters my mind. I mean, why would I, if you looked for something for three years and barely got it and you had to pay full retail, or some of the stuff I paid more than full retail, I would never even consider selling it because I'll never get it again. Um, yeah. And the value fluctuates too. So. There's nine factors here that you, that you can you can put into play when you're considering, but you do not have to consider all of them. The the they're going to be weighted in a certain way based on your own objectives, goals, and resources. And if you like the sound of something, that's by far the most important factor. Yes, which on our outline here, looking, you kind of zero in a little bit more on factor one, which is sound, which. Just to kind of read a little what you have, I think I think you've worded this very well. What constitutes a bad, good, or great sound is subjective. Descriptive or flowery adjectives can be helpful, but a sound slash video file gives you a much better idea. Uh, and as you said before, playing the thing yourself is really important. And and 
as you've stated on your, your outline, the room you play it in changes and, and it might sound okay. And you know, if you're in guitar center or a drum shop or whatever, you get home and the thing doesn't sound anything near what you thought it was. I remember as a kid buying my first like ZBT crash and at guitar center, I was like on a DW kit and I'm like, this is amazing. And I get home and I'm like, okay, this doesn't sound nearly as good as I thought, but, but comparatively, you just got to, you know, keep it all into perspective and, and, and find what's right for you. And it changes, too. The, the symbol that I would have loved 10 years ago is not the symbol I love today. That's why it's cool to have variety, different sets. Um, and yeah, absolutely. There's there's nothing. It, it, it's, it's a journey. It's an imperfect science. So you bring the symbol home from the Chicago drum show and you feel like you've really factored in. I mean, let's say you're a diligent person in a, in a, in a really, um, you know, a really smart shopper and you feel like you factored in all nine factors and you feel like you got a great deal. You check the condition. It's no, it's no condition issues. You get it home and you, you hit it, but boy, it sounds just as great as I, I thought at the show. And then you put it up with your, you bought a 20 and you put it up with your 18 and your 16 and you hit them together. And the 20 just doesn't sound right. <laughs> you, you, you know, it sounds yeah. great on its own. I, I went through this with 24s. I, I, I had a 24 and I hit it. As, Man, I love that. Put it up with another 24 doesn't work and and going mm, going yeah. th- going through the process so you can be as as uh specific or picky or not as you would like to in this process and the cool thing is unlike shopping for a, a modern symbol there's so much variation between the two that there is no right or wrong you can um so I, I have a quote here from my friend Casey Smith, and he is awesome. He um, is a really great player. Uh, he's one of the Vitalizer artists who plays Vitalizer pedals, and he's got a hi-hat stand. And I really love sending him stuff for free because he gives me feedback, and then he tags me. And it's not just like someone who has their hand out for something for free. He really is on the same level with this stuff. And I know he's been on a sure. journey to find symbols for a long time. He ended up really loving trans stamps. And I asked him for this episode, Casey, what do you look for when you're shopping for an old symbol? And I'm just going to read this um, verbatim because I think he said it perfectly. He said, a balance of stick wash and highs lows. It's the marriage of the highs and lows that gets me. The 50 Zildjians are a full spectrum of sounds, but with a softness that is also hard to find. I feel like modern dark symbols get lost unless they have more weight to them. Modern bright symbols seem to lack the fullness of lows and just cut through everything. Vintage stuff has the perfect blend that allows you to be heard, but fills the right amount of space. That's really beautiful, Casey. That's, Ka- that's really that beautiful, Casey, beautiful. because, and, and yeah. also, it just shows that you are pretty far on this journey. I know that he just bought a, a 20 inch trans stamp and he's had like five or six other ones. That language just shows such a level of sophistication. And when you watch his Instagram videos and you listen to his symbols, you know, the ability to, the, the, the overtones, the undertones, is it high, is it low, does it blend? When you, when you hear them hit the 18 and the 20 together and the difference between them and the separation of the bell, you can tell that this is a person who's really serious about their cymbal sounds. Not only, he, he, uh, he's tried modern cymbals, he's tried Turkish cymbals. He, I know he owns lots of different things. He owns things that are made by different makers, but he has, in, in the process that we've described, he has gone really far to the point where the sound that he hears in his head, what he wants a symbol to sound like is the sound that he hits every time he sits down to play. And true, it was not an easy thing to accomplish and to be able to articulate it that well. I, I'm really glad that he, he was fine with me sharing this quote because I, I think it um, really epitomizes everything we've discussed so far. When you put in the yeah. work, this is the, the payoff. You can end up with a symbol sound that's not only completely unique to you, but this is... You know, when I was 18 years old and I started wanting a different sounding ride symbol, I had a 21 inch A custom projection ride and it sounded great. You could crash on it. And I, and I started hearing these other rides, these old K's, and different K's and stuff, K custom. I thought, you know, wow, these are really expensive, but I want my ride to sound different. And I remember just t- trying all these different symbols, going to a drum shop, hit every single one. You know, you buy something, you get it and it's not quite right. It's too dry. It's too thin. But you don't know until you know. Yeah. Being being a very prudent 
shopper and someone who who has who dedicated themselves to to this journey of figuring out the sounds the payoff is when you get to where you want to be you know totally yeah very well said and i i will say looking him up uh casey schmidt's instagram handle is c schmidt so a c s c h m i d t y s on instagram look him up uh and and check him out because that's that was very well said and like you said that's the end of the rainbow is like having that like it's like it sounds like like almost like wine or something where to me i'm like i will drink a ten dollar bottle of wine and be happy i'm more of a beer guy but it's like it's it's but the people who really really enjoy it can tell the notes and everything in it and i think symbols are a lot like that um as well look at eric bender too um yes Eric Bender is an uh, amazing player and he has lots and lots of old K's and old A's. And he's he's a person who's a lot further on this journey than I am. I got really lucky to have the stuff that I have. Um, I also paid a lot of money for it and looked for years and years and years. But um, you can be the person who ends up with a great set of 60 symbols that you, that you really um, love, or you can be the guy who really wants a set of old stamp K's and wants to do a full set. My buddy Bob Meyer, he lives in New Jersey and he he's uh, in his 70s. I don't know exactly how old he is, but he's, you know, he's in his mid to late 70s, but very young at heart. And he has all his sets of old K's and old A's and he's had them forever. And he completed this journey in the 90s. So if you're starting this journey today, talk to someone like Bob, talk to someone like Eric, ask questions, shop, um, it, it, it pays to look at the details, but yeah, you can go as far. That's what's cool about it too. You can go as far down the rabbit hole as you want, or you can just stay near the entrance of the rabbit hole um, yeah. and get and get some cool, nice, consistent '60s sets. It, it, and it's yeah. really it's really about what sounds right to you, what feels right to you, and about having fun. And just it's supposed to be fun and enjoyable. And uh, you know, if you're like struggling to feed your kids with money, then don't go out and buy some twelve hundred dollar symbol or something. <laughs> that which uh, we're all tempted to do but looking at the next one considering a source I feel like because of time and we're trying to not have this be a two and a half hour episode I think you did a good job of explaining it but I really like how you have issues to be mindful of can we hit on that a little bit or is there anything in there that I want to make sure you hit yeah I think I think during the during the first section where we talked about the source I think that's good enough for now Um, but I will speed run the issues to be mindful of so um trusted source versus untrusted source. There could be um, a lot of reasons why someone might sell you something that's not what they said it was. Uh, And it's not always deception. So um, really considering your source to me is a very important one. I have certain people, certain shops that I would never buy a symbol from them, even if the price was right. And even if I loved it, just because I, I believe in speaking with your wallet, I think that if you really do not trust a source, even if they are a source that has a lot of inventory coming through their hands, um, if you don't trust the source, then speak with your wallet. Say, I don't trust the way that you handle and sell symbols, and no matter what you have, I'm not ever gonna buy anything from you. I'm pretty far down this rabbit hole where I have had to blacklist um, certain certain dealers and um, that I think is it's the strongest thing you can do is speak with your wallet. You know, hey, I don't like the way you're doing business or or the way that you handle this transaction, and I'm now I'm not going to give you any more of my money. I, I yeah. think I think that's a you know that's the right you have as a consumer. Um, sure. But you'll know you'll know if you run into an issue. It's usually you bought something and it's not as described, and that's a really common issue. It's also common, very easy to solve now, uh, like with PayPal. Even if you bought something from a drum shop and you got it and it is cracked, and let's say that you paid through your credit card, call your credit card and say, hey, this person sold me something and when I got it, it was cracked. So I want my yeah, money sure. back. And maybe, and obviously always give the dealer or the seller a chance to make it right. But if they're being a stick in the mud and they're saying, well, you know, that's tough luck, then not only can you never do business with them again, but call your credit card company or PayPal. Never pay for something yeah. with friends and family, PayPal. Always pay for that goods and services. Good, that's, yeah. good, you, that's good advice. You pay, you pay a little bit more, it's like 3% or whatever, which on a you know, $600 or whatever symbol, that actually does end up being a sort of substantial amount of money of, of like extra 
that you're paying, but you you'd be amazed what you can get what what's covered with that. So yes, great uh, actionable advice right there. Yeah, and that's just that's just I mean you could do that as like a that could be the end result that you take away from all of the source considerations. If you don't trust the source, then don't do business with them because this stuff is not rare, especially if you're putting together a 60s, 70s set of symbols. You know, you want an 18, 20, and a 22 and a pair of 14 inch hi hats. You have, it's a buyer's market because there's tons of this stuff. So when you're shopping, factor that all in and don't do business with people that you don't trust. Um, yeah. That's also why I like doing business in person with cash because it's very easy. I'm here, I am interested in the symbol, here's your price, here's what I would like to pay. It's You can almost always close that gap. So let's say you have that 28 inch trans stamp symbol that I'm super interested in, but you want $3,000 for it. Well, I'm here and I have $1,000 in cash. So- Money do talks. You want, yeah, do you want it? You know, usually. Yeah, sure. I have bought some crazy symbols for some really good prices because I had cash and the people were motivated sellers. So, yeah. I, I think I think this is a good spot to to wrap it up because we've gone through the timeline. Here, here's you know, this is all stuff that you can you can figure out on your own. But when you are on this journey and you decide you want to play vintage items, here's the considerations and good luck and have fun on your journey because I've had a lot of fun and now I'm in the stage where I get to sit down and play these symbols and, and just be really inspired by by the instruments. Um, I have nothing against modern symbols. I, I actually own modern-ish Turkish symbols that I play, um, you know, I, I, that I play in uh, a band with and I don't use my old Zildjian's but when I sit down at, at my main set, you know, my Camcos and I put up a set of matching trans stamps, you know, that sound is, is the, is the payoff. That's, that's the, um, that's the end result of all of, all of these things we're talking about, you know, you have done such a good job again, as a, as a pretty young guy of like, uh, really being very knowledgeable and it's no joke where we go to the drum shows and you pick something up and you know about it and you look at it, but you're also just like very approachable about this whole thing. So uh, if anyone is at the Chicago show, which I don't know if you're going to be there this year, I guess you're still figuring that out. N- not this year, but I'm, I'm, um, on, I'm on the fence. I had to pick Covington or Chicago and I picked yeah. Coving- Covington. I might still go to the Chicago show, but as a person who is 90% completed this journey, I no longer suffer from that FOMO. I don't worry that that 28 inch symbol is going to be there because what's going to happen is a dealer's going to scoop it up and I'll see it online in a week. And then I can still get that symbol without having to ever leave my house. So yeah. not that that would be, I mean, obviously you love to have a great story and you find it from the original owner's grandson and you get a great price, but that's not exactly realistic, especially at a show as big as Chicago. If you're going to, now, if you're going to go to the Delaware show or the Pennsylvania show and shop, yeah, you're much more likely to find a big, a, a really great deal because there's fewer dealers there. But when there's 30 to 50 dealers in a room, now it's pretty, uh, pretty unlikely that you're going to find a slam dunk deal. You're probably going to have to buy it from one of the dealers and you're probably going to have to pay, you know, a higher price. But yeah. that's all part of it. The the ecosystem and how it exists and how you function in that ecosystem is totally up to you as a buyer. And um, yeah. that that would be my closing advice is is just to make sure that you um, are true to yourself and your goals and your budget. You know, um, because it's going to look different for for everybody. The symbols that that I have ended up with that I really love are going to be totally different from the symbols that someone else. And that's why it's really cool to see people. Um, like my buddy Luke Kondrich, who's on a similar journey. You know, he wants old. Yeah. He wants old symbols. I think you probably met Luke. He's, I did, Luke. We've been emailing about. He's going to do his, his. He and his boss at their company are going to do an episode about history of uh, drumhead art, not painted drumheads. That's a different thing. But like, you know, the sure. decal, like GK and BR, and fast forwarding. That BR. that's awesome. Yeah. Luke's a great guy. I met him in 2019 when he was you know barely 20 years old, and. It's 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 just cool because at that same the 2009 Covington show where I met Luke, I picked up a 24 inch block stamp A, and that became the first 24 that I had that I kept because I'd had plenty of other 24s that I had picked up and they just they weren't right, but that one that was the first symbol where I hit it and 
everything started to make sense. Wow, this is exactly what I want. Now I want the 26. And now I have, well, I don't want to get too, too much into what I have, yeah. but um, <laughs> I, have, I have everything I want. I have a 24, I have a 25, I have a 26. I have wow. you know several 26s, several 24s. Mm. So that to me is really fun because now I can put together sets. So 26, 25, 24, 16 inch hi hats. I'm I'm pretty happy with that setup. But you know, a different person is going to look for something completely different. So yeah, I love. It's a whole other topic, but I do love the idea of putting together sets and the fun of that and making things that work. You know, you've got your set of vintage whatever A's or your set of vintage. Uh, you know, trans stamp or, or you've got all you can put together different pieces or even more modern like, you know, you have a set of a customs or something like that. It's fun sure. to have that that grouping of symbols. But um, awesome, Vincent. Well, this is great. So uh, everyone listening, Vincent is kind enough to um, hang around. Actually, we're going to record it at a later date, but we're going to do it a uh, bonus episode on Patreon, which we're going to talk about uh, Vincent's personal symbol journey of kind of the things he has. And I'll mention th- my symbol journey as well, which is not really as impressive as Vincent's because he's <laughs> clearly knows this stuff, but I've collected symbols over the years. And then also we're going to talk about knockoffs uh, that you hear about your Zilcos, your Allergens, your Xenogen, all of your gins that aren't Zilgen. Um, yeah. So we'll do that and we'll record it at a later date. Um, to make sure that we have time because this uh, is great, but it, it went a little longer than we were hoping originally. So um, thank you again to Gabriel Martinez and uh, GM Designs uh, for sponsoring the show on Patreon and all that good stuff. I will say the bonus episode idea in general was Vincent's idea. That was your idea. So thank you very much for that. It's been, mm-hmm. you know, the why re- people signed up for Patreon. So uh yeah, buddy. Thank you for being here, Vincent. I appreciate it, man. You're you're very welcome. I think the Patreon is well worth the money. I mean, you get extra episodes. It's not like you're just getting a shirt or a sticker. I mean, you can get a shirt or a sticker or a shout out like Gabriel. Thank you, Gabriel, for doing that. Um, but uh, yeah, Patreon is well worth it. The tiers start at $2 and it's pretty much just a no brainer. If you're absorbing this content, um, it's a great way to, to support the podcast. Um, I do want to mention because I d- didn't... Um, come around to this, but Mike Layton, who who passed last year tragically, yeah. he was the guy who really got me into this at the 2000, geez, it must've been 17 or 18 show. He started coming to these shows and boy, was he a wealth of knowledge. His knowledge still exists in archive format through Drum Forum. So you can go on there and if you see M. Layton talking about, he knew a lot, a lot of stuff, but he knew a lot about Zildjian's. He probably knew more about Zildjian's than anyone I've ever met. And obviously a lot of people know a lot of things, but he was the first person I talked to. And it was because I was looking for that 26 to complement my 24. And he had three of them. There was only three in the whole room. And he had all three. Maybe he bought them at the wow. show, but I mean, he was just a wealth of knowledge. And um, seeing the way that he collected, talking to him, interacting with him, I is was such a, such a privilege. So, um, Rest in peace to Mike and and thank you, Mike, yeah. for for really helping me along in this journey. Always share your information. Don't hold things close. Don't keep don't keep secrets. If 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 you find people who are interested in the same thing, um, and also don't hoard hoard your symbols. I'm not really one to talk with that, but I am going to let go of a lot of my symbols <laughs> in the next couple of years. Um, sure, but Mike really epitomized that. Not only really being just super knowledgeable about it, but also um, having an amazing ear and then of course sharing that knowledge with with further generations you know it's very important yeah. that is nice and i know he meant a lot to you and probably a lot to the people who listen to this who are longtime collectors and i uh it's an unfortunate thing but this podcast it's been around for four and a half years now it has become a platform for there's some people who have been spoken about on the podcast or who have been on the show who aren't around anymore so again it's nice to thank and remember those people so i appreciate you doing that um so again vincent you're a real buddy in the community and you're a pillar of the drum community and i think everyone enjoys seeing you at the shows uh, and enjoys what you've said today to learn more about zildjian symbols and uh, we will have you back on for more pedal stuff down the road and another episode i'm sure so um for now vincent thank you for being here my friend thanks so much Bart. i really appreciate it